And then, of course, you get into the real minutia of what does it really mean to, to be able to squat safely? And again, for most people, myself included, before I was really putting a lot of thought into this, uh, to, to do a, a heavy hip hinge activity like a squat or a deadlift, you will naturally tend to fall into a place of lumbar compression. You will compress the spine when you do these things. That's not that sustainable. What you really want to be able to do is get to a point where you can do those things under spinal traction, which sounds very counterintuitive. Most people think of traction as something you can only achieve when you hang, which mm -hmm. is elongating the spine. But it turns out if you generate concentric intra-abdominal pressure from diaphragm to pelvis, you can actually stretch out the spine while you're under load. And once you start doing it biomechanically correctly at the age of 40 or 50 or whatever, and you start to carry that forward, um, then you're sort of winning on two fronts, uh, with the more important of those being by the time you get to 90, you actually have the ability to even move in that direction and stabilize your trunk which is the rate limiting step for a squat. So it seems it seems like with many of these movements and I suppose in many things in life if you want to play the long game you kind of have to check your ego at the door, right? Because you would probably be making some trade-offs in terms of the amount of weight you can lift, etc. if you're going to be training technically to be able to perform these movements at 90, right? You might have, if, if you're not going to be doing a, a wide power lifter squat with a limited range of motion compared to say an Olympic assed heels squat, very different in terms yeah. of biomechanics and what you can do. I mean, I work with three people, um, a woman named Beth Lewis, a guy named Michael Stromsness and another guy named Michael Rintala. Um, and, the, and all of them have a training in something called dynamic neuromuscular stabilization or DNS. And then they all, of course, bring in their own expertise outside of that from powerlifting and other athletic disciplines. And Beth, who's sort of the one that kind of defaults into my deadlift program. Um, so I deadlift twice a week and we started from scratch. So we have basically, per, you know, imagined I've never deadlift, even though I started deadlifting at the age of 15 and powerlifted all the way through high school her view is no, we're starting from scratch. It's as though you've never done this before. And one day a week I'm doing straight bar, you know, a very traditional closed leg, straight bar deadlift. And I mean, she had me starting at 105 pounds and I was not allowed to progress from that for a couple of months. And I was like, Beth, at least let me just get to 135 so I can use the goddamn 45s <laughs> on the side of this thing. I mean, it's getting ridiculous here. And she's like, no, you're not ready yet. And, you, you know, so... I'm so, just imagining a row of like five or 10 pound plates with the bar, yeah. your knuckles scraping the floor. <laughs> so, well, luckily we had 10 pound no, bumpers. No, no, I'm space. just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> so... so, so um, so we were juxtaposing the straight bar deadlift with very lightweight and, you know, she was letting me use more weight on the hex bar. Um, but we had to fix a whole bunch of movement defects. Yeah. Hex bar, for those who don't know, also known as a trap bar, so-called, uh, in the former case, because it is a hexagon that you step inside of so that effectively the bar path is traveling through the center line of your body. And so the hex bar is much easier to deadlift because you are in a more advantaged position, but it's also easier to do incorrectly. And the reason for that is you don't have a bar in front of your shins. And so if you're like me, you tend to default into a very quad dominant deadlift. And what Beth realized um, was we had to break that cycle. And the only way we were going to get you to use your hamstrings, Peter, is if we changed your position and I, you know, the, the, uh, the idea was the best way to change your position was put a bar in front of your shins that you can't go through. So anyway, that's one example, but yeah, it, it, it to your point about checking ego, um, so much of what I do these days in the weight room looks really silly and it's not using nearly that much weight. I mean, today you should have seen me <laughs> like what I was doing in the gym today was sort of comical to watch. Um, you know, a lot of single arm pressing in you know, positions that are really forcing me to generate the right amount of concentric force inside my trunk. Uh, and when and you, you say concentric force in the trunk, what do you mean? Because I'm, I'm familiar with concentric, eccentric, as thought of, say, in a bicep crawl with lifting the weight, in this case, contracting, 
uh, concentric movement versus eccentric lowering. So picture like someone lengthening. putting a yeah yeah picture somebody putting a balloon inside your belly. Let's pretend for a moment they could strip all your guts and liver and everything out, and you could put a cylindrical shaped. Um, but round top and round bottom balloon inside your abdomen. So at the top, it's mimicking sort of the shape of your uh, diaphragm. And at the bottom, it's sort of like the shape of your, your pelvis. And then the idea is you sort of start to blow that up and you generate this pressure that comes out. So all of the muscles are sort of getting longer and under more tension and the, the, the force is sort of uniform all the way throughout. And that that's called intra-abdominal pressure, or IAP. Right. Mm -hmm. And what I've realized over the past, you know, a little over a year now is most of us have lost the ability to put air into our pelvis or put pressure really is the right way to think about it. You're not literally putting air in your pelvis. The air doesn't go below the diaphragm, but we don't know how to generate that pressure in the abdomen. And by being able to do that, that's what en enables you to actually stabilize your spine. Um, so, so people who say, you know, people say to me all the time, I can't believe you would deadlift like that seems so crazy. Aren't there better ways to get the same activation of the muscles in your glutes or hamstrings or quads? And the answer is yes and no. I mean, you can certainly do those things without having to go under that load, but a deadlift is an amazing audit as is a squat for that matter. And, and I, I, do, I think of those things as audits because if you're doing them correctly and once you learn the proprioceptive cues that you're supposed to feel, you know when you're having a good day and a bad day. Yeah. And if you're having a good day, 